and thank Paco for bringing me the microphone. <laughs> if he hadn't, you wouldn't be able to hear me. I'd like to start out by looking at 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. We're going to read from the New American Standard this evening. He says in verse 5, 2 Peter 1, Now for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supplying moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor untruthful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make your calling about his calling and choosing for you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the interest into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Our Father and Jesus wants us to continually to grow in his word. And when we do, will be what God expects us to be. We can never forget who we are. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, no matter what we think, no matter what we say, we need to remember that we are the children of God Almighty. And he has chosen us to be his children. He has chosen us to be holy as he is holy. And we're all doing our very, very best to follow the example of Jesus the Christ. He died for us. He left us an example that we should follow it. If I asked you, who do you respect? What do you respect? What do you honor? Who do you honor? And then the other side, who don't we respect? What don't we respect? There's a very short verse in 1 Peter 2.17, but like everything else in God's word, it is very, very powerful. And that's what I'd like to devote our lesson to this evening. 1 Peter 2, 17. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. These four verses, or this one verse, encompasses the four things that are in our lives. How we deal with others. How we deal with the church. What is our understanding in dealing with God? And then the government. How do we react to the government? He says of all three of these, other than God, we are to honor them. Honor is placing a great value on someone or something. He first by saying, honor all people. Sometimes it's good to look at what it doesn't say. It doesn't say honor them if they're good people. It doesn't say honor them if you like them. He says honor all people, all, everyone. What is the value that we place on our neighbors, the people around us, all of these people? Those we come in contact at the grocery store. Those that park their cart in the middle of the aisle and nobody can get by. How do we react to them? 
Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2. Make my joy complete. How do we do that, Paul? How do we make your joy complete? By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. This can apply to honoring all people and honoring the brotherhood. I put you first. I put you before me. When I go in the grocery store and the lady that's checking us out is having a bad day and she's not, she's just a little snippy, how do I react? Do I act with honor towards her, with respect towards her, with love? Where do we stand with others? I need to be always conscious of other people. Other people, the brotherhood, because God created every human being in his image. Every human being was created in the image of God. And God loves everybody. Now, that verse is misused, I know. But God loves the believer and God loves the unbeliever because he sent his son, Jesus the Christ, to die for those that are living in sin and I should respect them. I should care enough about them to put them first and do my best to bring them to Jesus Christ. Now, just a brief explanation. We know if a person dies in sin, he's going to be lost, even though God loves him. But God loves everybody. The best example, I think, of this, for this one, in love the brotherhood, is found in Luke 10. We won't read that, but it's the Good Samaritan. Here's this poor man. He's beaten, all bloody, and he's stripped, and he's laying in the middle of the road, dying. And luckily for him, here comes a man of God, a priest. And the priest walks up to him and just glances real quick and zoom, goes around him and gone. Just left him there. Didn't really pay attention to him. Well, maybe something was going on we didn't know about. But luckily, here comes another man of God, a Levite. And he's coming along and he looks down, he looks the other way and zoom, he's gone. They just left him laying there. <coughs> now we're to honor all men, honor them, respect them, show them mercy and kindness. Do unto them as we would have done unto us. But they didn't do that. And then here comes the Samaritan. The Samaritans were hated by the Jews. So you would expect that Samaritan just to walk around like the other two. But he didn't. He stopped. He bent down. And he took care of the man. And he picked him up and he carried him to town and took him to someone and said, please take care of him. Here's a bunch of money. And when I come back this way again, if you need more money, I'll give it to you. That is honoring all men. That is respecting all men. Our neighbor where we live, every time we've seen him, he wants to talk religion. Now, nothing wrong with that, but he gets wild about it. And he thinks he's going to save me. 
and he gets very loud, so loud the male lady hears him. I'm to respect him, I'm to honor him, and I'm to treat him nice. Honor all people. Honor all people. And then it goes on and says, love the brotherhood. Love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Love each and every Christian in this building. Love in each and every Christian in other places. We love our brothers and sisters. Let's look at John 13. We all know these verses. John 13. Verse 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciple, if you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. You know, if I get upset with somebody and lose my temper and say a bunch of things, they won't know I'm a Christian. They won't know I'm a child of God. They'll think just the opposite. So I must love everyone. I must treat everyone with respect and honor. The way Jesus did. Now let's look at Romans 12. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Arbor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Preserving in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saint. Practicing hospitality. There again, we could use Luke 10. The Good Samaritan. <coughs> Love the brotherhood. Love our brothers and sisters. Now, I dug deep on this list last week to make sure I wasn't guilty of this. Am I like the priest and the Levite? Is there somebody here I don't dislike, but I'd rather not talk to them, so I try to avoid them. Digging deep, I think I'm okay. <laughs> but do we try to avoid somebody, somebody that we do not feel comfortable with? That's what happened in that parable of the Good Samaritan. We're brothers and sisters. We love each other. We honor each other. We respect each other. We want to be together with each other. We want to be united. Is there someone that I haven't talked to in six months? a year. You know, it'd be very easy for Barbara and I just to, when the amen said, just to stand there and visit with Dennis and Trudy. They're always right there. And now we got Morgan. And the cooks, they're always there. Just stay in our own little group. But I don't believe God wants me to do that. God wants me to get to know all of you so I can love all of you. And if you need help, I'll know about it. We have to know each other before we can love each other. I learned a valuable lesson about 20 years ago. We knew a couple, brother and sister, married. 
They were all, in, both of them involved in the church, doing everything, going over to people's houses and everything. After services, everybody talking to them. Then she became single. She told me, Dave, everything's changed now. Now that I'm single, nobody comes and talks to me. I'm not invited over to anybody's houses anymore. And I'll tell you, that got to me. That got to me. We have several members that are single. Young ones, older ones. We can't neglect them. We can't neglect them. They need us. We need them. And you know, in almost every case, brothers and sisters, all that it takes to encourage somebody is a how do you do. How you doing? It's good seeing you. I have a single brother here that makes me feel good every time I walk in the door because he always sticks his hand out to me. He's encouraging me. And I hope I'm encouraging him. Love the brotherhood. Love it. Love each other. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. What does that mean, to fear God? You know, if I'm living right and doing right, what do I have to fear? But it says that here. It is a reverent fear for God. And when we have that right fear for God, it will inspire us to constantly be careful how we treat people. It will control our motives. When I have that correct fear for God, I'm going to be very careful in what I do. I realize he is God Almighty. He's our Father. And when I have that love and fear for my Father, I will treat you right. I will treat other people right. And our next point, I will be right with the government. When we have that fear, we understand how much God hates, hates sin and his judgment against sin. That's when I need the fear. It's when I'm sinning. When I'm not doing everything I should be doing. God hates sin. When I got this lesson up, it's really helped me to be conscious of how am I doing these things. Am I honoring all people? Do I love the brotherhood as I should? Do I hate sin as much as God hates sin? And when I do sin, do I realize the judgment that could come upon me if I truly don't repent? Don't be so scared of God that we run and hide because we are told in Romans 8, 38 that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. God is there wanting to love each and every one of us. He's there. And so what I need to do when I take that step back, I need to take that step forward and go into God's loving hands again and say, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry. Love all, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God. Now here comes the rough one. Honor the king. Honor government. We're going to go to Romans 13. But let me make a comment. The world is not any worse today than it was in the day of Jesus. It's not any worse today than it was in the days of Noah. Nothing under the sun has changed. We live in one of the best countries in the world. How would you like to be in Russia now? How would you like to be in Ukraine? Or be in these countries that you have no say whatsoever in the government? You don't get the vote. No say. You don't think the government was corrupt in Jesus' day? In Paul's day? The government said you must do this as a Christian. It goes against God's will. You don't do it, you die. I mean, <laughs> yeah, if you don't do it, you die. I almost had it backwards there. If you do what the king says, you'll live. We do not like some of the laws that have been passed and may pass. But we won't be put to death. But he says, honor the king. Honor our government. Let's look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. He didn't say everybody that's not a Christian. He said everybody from God to those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And, all, and they who are opposed will receive condemnation to themselves. Now, he's not saying if our new governor gets in, governor gets into office and say, nobody can worship on Sunday. He's not saying that. We must worship on Sunday. But look what he says about the government. Every person is to be in subjection to it. For there is no authority except from God. And those which are existing are established by God. Established by God. Let's go back to our text in First Peter. First Peter chapter two. I got a new Bible and none of the pages are where they're supposed to be. And none, of the, none of the verses are where they're supposed to be. So I gotta look at it now and then. First Peter chapter two. You know, I can stare at this as long as I want, but I'm in second Peter. That's what I mean. To the pages aren't in the right place. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or governors are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you will silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Some people came to Jesus, and they were trying to trap Jesus. 
Now, who should we obey, Caesar or you? Seems to be a conflict here. What should we do? And Jesus said, show me a coin. Show me a coin. And he said, whose picture is on that coin? And Mark chapter 12, 17, Jesus answers the question. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So what do we do as Christians to honor our government? Well, we vote. We look at all the candidates and we pick the one, the closest one, that has the beliefs like we do. And we pray and we pray and we pray that we'll make the right decision. We pay our taxes and then that ends it. Then we love the Lord God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. This is a hard one, isn't it? Brendan said something several weeks back that got me really thinking. He said, I will badmouth the government as much as Jesus did. Barbara and I will never discuss politics with anyone. We won't do it. Because our feelings have been hurt before and we may have hurt others. So we won't discuss it. We'll discuss it with ourselves when we're trying to decide who to vote for and then on some issues what we should do and shouldn't do. Jesus has called us to be light in this dark world. There's sin all around us. And Jesus said, I want you to be the light to the world. Be a shining light. Don't put your light under the bed, don't hide it, but you be a light to the world. Let them see God in you. Let this world that is in sin know what to do and how to do it, how to live. That's up to you. Show them. He didn't say, use that light to complain about the darkness. He said, let your light shine so the world can see you living in me. You know, when you and I badmouth people, whether it's the people in the world, people in our congregation, the government, almost every time it causes ungodly thinking. Someone could come to me and say, this person didn't admit, maybe I voted for that person. Maybe I didn't. But I know if I complain about our congregation to my neighbor, that has just torn the church down. I have driven a wedge there that I'll probably never, ever be able to get out. If I go around bad-mouthing our government, who am I going to hurt? How many people am I going to hurt? I'm certainly hurting myself. I'm hurting myself and others that hear me. My words should be seasoned with God's word. Everything I say, everything I do, everywhere I go, should build me up in the most holy faith. It should raise 
up in people's eyes and let them see Jesus living in me. Should have let their head that off. Jesus living in me. Everything I say and do should build me up and it should be building you up. I want to be able to stand before God and Jesus in the day of judgment and have them say, you didn't tear anybody down. You built them up. I can't say that about my past, but I repented of it. That's our job, is to build each other up. Say words that encourage, not discourage. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Be at peace with all men. You notice the word that he uses a lot? All. All. And I'm not saying this is easy, brothers and sisters. But God is for us. Nobody can be against us. He said, don't fear the person that can kill your body, but fear, fear the person that can get you condemned to hell. Philippians 4, 9. Philippians 4, 9. The things you have heard and learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the brotherhood. Um, Hebrews 13. I don't know where I got the idea for this verse. I got two of them in Hebrews. But Hebrews 13, verse 18. Pray for us. For we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. Honorably in all things. And then Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Barbara's always reading me little things that she finds and I think she's trying to make me perfect. <laughs> this is one she found and said would go good with this lesson and I appreciate it. If people stop looking for things that offend them and start looking for the things that inspire them, what a wonderful world this would be. I really hope this has helped all of you as much as it did me. For those of you that don't know, gas prices are soaring. <laughs> They're getting higher and higher and higher. And groceries, they're growing up. And when we go to grocery shopping, I have to hold my mouth like that because I was always saying, I remember when we paid 59 cents for that. <laughs> They're going up. And more than likely, water's gonna skyrocket. Because of this drought, we don't have anything. But you know what? There's one thing that has not gone up there's one thing that's free, and that's salvation. Jesus paid the price that we can be free. Jesus paid it. 
And when we believe in Jesus Christ and we are baptized into the waters of baptism, we come up out of those waters to walk a new life. Jesus paid the price. And as we're walking that new life, heading towards heaven, we're going to need help. We're going to need each other. And we make mistakes. But God took care of that too. We can come to each other and say, I need help. And we can pray for each other and help each other, pray together. The invitation is for anyone that's here this evening in this room or anybody that's listening online, if you haven't been baptized, please talk to us. We'll sit down on a one-to-one -one basis and teach you Jesus. If you're listening to us tonight and you don't feel comfortable doing that, we got a correspondence course online. Take advantage of it. Jesus paid it all, and we're here to help you in any way, you can, any way we can. If you're subject to evening, we pray that you'll come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song.